Welcome to the Science for the Public lecture series. Science for the Public is an organization committed to bringing science information and issues to the general public. Visit our website for our program listings and blog. Good evening and welcome to the Robbins Library. I'm just going to say a brief word about the Friends. Um, if you want more information, there are pamphlets on the back in the, um, with all of the goodies. So help yourself at any time. And um, the next couple of programs that we're having here is Wednesday, November 5th. The Graveyard Girls will be here to tell us all about Arlington Cemeteries. And on Thursday, December 18th, we're having Silent Movies, Big Business with Laurel and Hardy, and Sherlock Jr. with Buster Keaton. So without further ado, I will hand you over to Yvonne Stapp from Science for the Public. Yeah, thank you very much. Sorry. <laughs> Good evening, and thank you all for coming out. Uh, I'm Yvonne Stapp for Science for the Public, and I welcome you to tonight's lecture at the Robbins Library, sponsored by Friends of the Robbins Library. Our speaker is Yane Kandev, and he is a professor and chair of the Department of Physics at Brandeis University, and I believe still co-director of the Brandeis Program in Quantitative Biology. He's here to explain a vitally important uh, biological Biological process, how the DNA molecule is folded, folded in the cell, and okay. why it's so important in medical and biological research. Dr. Kondev received his PhD in theoretical physics from Cornell University in 1995. He then became a postdoctoral fellow in physics at Brown University and then a member of the School of Mathematics at Princeton University uh, Institute for Advanced Study and was a lecturer in physics at Princeton before joining the physics department at Brandeis in 2000. Dr. Kondev has received numerous awards for both his research and his teaching, including a National Science Foundation Career Award, and that's a, the acronym, and the Cottrell Scholar Award. This year he was named one of 15 Howard Hughes Medical Institute select professors in the nation. He was also, or uh, is also, co-author of a major textbook in biophysics, The Physical Bio Biology of the Cell, his co-author. We appreciate Dr. Kondev's willingness to, expe to explain this very significant work to the general public tonight, and it is a great honor to welcome him. Um, thanks, Yvonne, and uh, thanks for the, to the library for inviting me, and thank you all for uh, coming out to uh, to uh, hopefully be entertained by a little bit of science uh, that I personally find very exciting. Uh, and hopefully, I will kind of be able to convey some of that excitement to you tonight. Um, so, uh, so let's see. So everyone's familiar with DNA. And the gen I mean, everyone's heard the concept of the genetic of the, of the genome and the genetic code. Is that correct? Yeah, OK, good. So, um, um, so as Yvonne said, I'm a physicist. And the other thing I'd like to sort of uh, convey to you is the idea that uh, there's a lot of physicists uh, getting involved in uh, trying to answer fundamental biological questions. And it's a very sort of exciting time in science where there's a lot of crosstalk between physics, biology, chemistry, computer science. And hopefully you'll see some of that uh, during today's uh, presentation as well. So, um, so I think most of you are familiar with the idea of, of, the gen of the genome and the DNA as being sort of a series of these letters. And somehow these letters uh, encode uh, the information that the cell needs in order to do its thing. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, DNA is also a molecule, meaning it has sort of uh, physical properties like its uh, uh, width, which is about two nanometers. And it can be very, very long. In fact, uh, if you were to take all the DNA that's in every one of our cells and stretch it out uh, and put, it, put all the sort of DNA uh, in one long line, that line would be about three meters, which is uh, about that big. Actually, sorry, what am I saying? Um, <laughs> uh, that's a meter, so uh, uh, three, three of those. And, um, um, and, uh, and so, 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 so this then raises a question, and what I'm going to try to uh, uh, explain today, tonight, is uh, uh, sort of 
what's, why this question is interesting. And the question is the following. So you have uh, something like a few meters of DNA, and, and this uh, long uh, stringy molecule has to be folded up inside the cell. Now the problem is, is that the cell, or the compartment which contains the DNA, is about a million times smaller. So in other words, the DNA has to be folded up about a million times over so that it can, be, uh, so it can fit inside the cell. And uh, what uh, scientists have been very interested uh, for the past uh, few decades is uh, what is the folded nature, what is the nature of this folded state, and I'll explain what I mean by that, and are there any rules to this folding? Because one thing you can imagine is that the folded state of the DNA inside the cell could just be completely random, which is what you would get if you just took, you know, this string and you just sort of randomly sort of uh, scrum crunched it up and uh, so that it fits inside my hand, right? And what we'll see, one of the sort of surprises that has come about over the last few decades is that actually this folded state is not random, that there's uh, patterns to it, there's regularities to it, and these regularities are, are uh, turning out to be important uh, for the function of DNA. Okay, so that's a bit of an overview of what I'm going to talk about tonight. Uh, but in order to get us there, I thought it'd be good if I gave you a little bit, uh, uh, a sort of very short introduction uh, to the history of, 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 of genomes and uh, this idea that there's this uh, long stringy molecule in our cells that contains the blueprints uh, of, of life. And uh, okay, so if we start really far back, uh, then uh, there's sort of uh, the prehistory of thinking about uh, heredity and, and genes, and that prehistory uh, is essentially everything that can't, comes before uh, Gregor Mendel. And, uh, and in some ways, uh, if you think about sort of uh, genetics and the idea of uh, sort of, uh, of uh, selecting uh, certain genes is, is what would be sort of the, the modern version, uh, the modern sort of statement, selecting certain genes because they uh, bestow certain useful quantities to, to the organisms. That, you know, that, that idea goes back when uh, humans first started uh, sort of cultivating plants and, and, and uh, crossbreeding animals. Uh, of course, uh, people didn't know what, you know, didn't know what the sort of molecular basis, obviously, of that was. But they, but there was, but certainly they, they sort of discovered the idea that if they kept plants with useful traits, then in the next generation, those traits would be present and they could sort of uh, uh, slowly develop sort of uh, species that, uh, that or, or they could develop sort of plants that, that were useful in the sense that they produced uh, uh, useful results for, for, for human uh, sort of uh, needs. Um, the first time people, I mean, so presumably people way back, you know, uh, a few, you know, a, a, you know, a few thousand years ago had been thinking about sort of, uh, of these problems, but the first time it appears sort of in, in any kind of uh, written form is uh, not surprisingly in the time of the Greeks and, uh, and sort of the, uh, it was uh, Hippocrates who, uh, who thought about sort of the problem of heredity and, uh, and he had this kind of proposal that there are these tiny particles uh, for every part of the body uh, and that each uh, uh, parent uh, has uh, these particles, and then when an offspring is produced, there's a mixing of these particles. And, and Aristotle had uh, uh, essentially a similar idea, and all the ideas leading up to Mendel uh, had sort of one uh, basic uh, 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 component to them, and that was the idea that, that, that sort of these uh, traits that are inherited, and you know, what people noticed is that offspring were often similar to parents, and the idea was that somehow that the, that the parents contain some kind of a substance, like a, you can think of it as a fluid, and then when uh, you have the offspring, you get kind of mixing of these fluids. So there's this idea of mixing of traits, and so that the offspring come up, come up sort of as mixed versions of, of parents. And, um, and this, these ideas didn't really go, go very far, and it was really sort of uh, in the, in the mid-1800s uh, uh, with the work of Gregor Mendel that really sort of modern understanding of genes and genetics comes, uh, comes, uh, comes uh, to light. And uh, so, you know, if you kind of, uh, some of the younger members of the audience have probably sort of seen this very recently. Uh, some, some of you might have seen this uh, many, many years ago. But, you know, Mendel was sort of looking at peas. He was growing peas in a pea garden, and then he was uh, looking at sort of statistical properties, or he was measuring how likely it was that, uh, that in the next generation, as he was growing peas, in the next generation that the plants had certain properties that the parent plants had. 
and by sort of analyzing uh, the, the, these P, you know, the, the, the P's as, as they were going from one generation to the other, he came up with this key idea. And the key idea was that there were some kind of, you can think of it as like atoms, they're called genes today, that there were some uh, you know, basic factors that could not be divided, that were sort of indivisible, and that these factors contained, that, that they carried traits. And that these factors, then the, the parent, uh, parents carried these factors, and it was these factors that were then uh, sort of uh, 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 bestowed upon the, the offspring, and that, that's sort of the, 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 the idea of heredity. So, so this was kind of Mendel's key insight that there was, in today's language, that there was a gene, in some sense, that made uh, the pods of the, of the beans green versus yellow. And then there, were, there was a gene, or this little, this entity, which he didn't know what it was, that made, the, that made the seeds either round or wrinkled or yellow or green or made the flowers purple or white. So, uh, so this, was, this was kind of the basic insight of Mendel. And then, after Mendel's discoveries, uh, sort of the next uh, 50 years or so, uh, what we have is a period uh, in, in science where people who are interested in this problem of heredity and uh, the, uh, what they're focusing on is the physical nature of the gene. So what is this particle? What is this thing that makes uh, uh, peas have seeds that are yellow versus green? Okay. And so, uh, so the, the kind of the big breakthrough came then at the turn of the century, uh, so only 40 years about later, where these two guys uh, essentially proposed the idea that these things that people were seeing in microscopes called chromosomes, uh, again, they didn't quite know what these things were. They were these stringy objects, the objects that, you'd, that you could see and that you can kind of color uh, in the cells, so that, therefore, the name chromosomes, uh, that the idea was that somehow these uh, contained the genes, that these contained these objects, these little stringy objects contained uh, these uh, fundamental particles of heredity that Mendel had discovered by studying uh, peas. So um, it was then a couple of years later in, at Columbia University in the lab of Thomas Hunt Morgan where this sort of chromosome hypothesis or chromosome idea, the idea that these, uh, that these uh, entities in cells called chromosomes carry genes, it was essentially finally uh, uh, sort of proven by looking at, uh, by looking at various uh, fruit flies and mutants of fruit flies with certain uh, properties, again, very similar to the way that Mendel was looking at peas and looking at different properties of peas. Um, what Morgan was doing was looking at fruit flies and was breeding fruit flies, and then he found fruit flies that had, uh, for instance, short antenna, where, mo where in, in normal fruit flies you have long antenna, and then he found fruit flies that had black bodies, uh, where normally you have gray bodies. And so what he was discovering here was the fact that there were genes that controlled properties like the color of the body, the redness of the eyes, whether the wings were normal or, had these, or they had these vestigial rings. Uh, wings, and uh, and so what he what he was able to show is that these traits are connect are well these traits are, connect are are determined by genes, and then he was able to show that these genes are carried by chromosomes. And the way he was able to show that was to show that certain traits go with uh, flies being male or female. And so the the idea and he and what people had observed was that the chromosomes in males and females were different. So then he made this logical connection that genes must reside on these chromosomes because the chromosomes are somehow related to, to whether the flies are male or female, and the genes then, uh, which are, because the genes are going with maleness or femaleness, they must also reside on chromosomes. And then, uh, and this is sort of where we're gonna take off in our story, uh, one of his undergraduate students, uh, this guy Alfred Sturdivant, uh, the story goes that he was working in Morgan's lab, pretty much blowing off all his uh, schoolwork, and he had this kind of uh, crazy idea at the time was to make a genetic map. So he had this idea that genes were somehow ordered on chromosomes because, you know, they, these chromosomes were stringy structures. So they were like, under the microscope, they looked like strings. So that naturally then, so then the idea was, well, if these genes sit on chromosomes, then you can ask if you have genes A, B, and C, which order do they go in? Like if you start from one end, is it A, B, C, or is it C, B, A? So there's this, so if you're thinking about the chromosome as being a linear structure, then there's a sense in which uh, you have an ordering of the genes. And so what 
Sturdivant figured out was the ordering of these, uh, of these genes that carry the different properties of the fruit fly. So he was able to say which gene is close to which other gene. Uh, and the way he did that was by looking at which of these uh, properties of the fruit flies, which uh, of these uh, properties went together. Okay, so he noticed that, that uh, fruit flies that had, a, for instance, that had black body were uh, occurring more often together with the trait that they had cinnabar eyes than a fruit fly that had a black body and brown eyes. So that then from that he was able to infer that the gene for cinnabar eyes and the gene for blackness were closer together along the chromosome than the gene for the black body and the brown eyes. And so he was able to make the first chromosome map in this way, a, a genetic map. And the genetic map uh, is the idea of saying where on the chromosome do different genes reside. Okay, so he wasn't able to tell you exactly, you know, First of all, this is in 1913. The idea that it's DNA that, that's really encoding the genes was not even formulated yet, but he was able to say, aha, there's this chromosome, and this gene is here. The other, this gene is close to, closest to it. The next gene is further away, and so forth. Okay, and that was the big, big break, breakthrough of Sturdivant. All right, so now let's uh, fast forward. And uh, what's really amazing about the history of, of biology, and in particular molecular biology, is that things are happening really, really, really fast. Uh, like compared to the field that I, that, I, that I sort of grew up in, which is physics, where if, you, if I were doing the history of physics, you know, maybe of history of modern physics, I would, I, would, I would have to sort of talk about 500 years ago and talk about Galileo and then talk about Newton and then talk about, you know, or before, you know, talk, before Newton, talk about Kepler. But the history is kind of very drawn out until we can't come to the modern era where we're sort of finally getting to the, uh, point where we have all the kind of fundamental laws of physics under our belt. Uh, the history of biology, uh, modern biology, sort of starts with Mendel and, and Darwin uh, in the mid 1800s, and then uh, in about a, you know in 150 years, uh, it just covers insane amount of ground. I mean, it just goes really, really fast. And for our story today, uh, a key event is 1953 when Watson and Crick figured out the structure of DNA. Before Watson and Crick, others had done experiments that showed that DNA is the part of the chromosome that contains the gene, okay? And, uh, and, uh, and how this information is encoded in the DNA is now, you know, figured out eight years later by Crick and collaborators in 1961. By 1977, the entire genome of a virus is sequenced, which means that for this, for this particular, for some virus, uh, the sequence of these letters, and these letters uh, correspond to the basic elements of the DNA, which I'll tell you about, uh, the whole sequence and, uh, is, is known. And then the same thing is accomplished uh, by 1996, so in, in a mere 20 years, for a much more complicated organism like Baker's yeast. Uh, two years later, we have a sequence of, of a worm, and only five years later, the Human Genome Project is completed uh, by... Um, by government-sponsored and a private organization. It's announced in 2003. And since 2003, uh, you know, every other uh, week, you end up opening up the New York Times or whatever uh, uh, paper, and you'll find the story about personal genomes, about how sequencing of genomes is going to fundamentally change the face of medicine, uh, and, 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 and that's where we are today. Those fundamental changes have not quite yet occurred, and, and that's one of the things that I want to talk about is what are the, what are the, sort of, what are the issues that we face in really harnessing the, the power that we have in terms of uh, getting these sequences. Okay, so, uh, okay, so let me now, uh, so that's all kind of in, in a bit of an introduction, but now let me try to get into the, into the heart of things. So what I want to talk about today are maps, okay? And one way to think about science is to really think about maps. It, mostly what science has done over the past few thousand years is make maps of things, okay? We make maps of things that we can't see. And that's really sort of one of the fundamentally uh, amazing things about science. Like we've mapped out the world of atoms. We can't see an atom. We can't even see a, an atom under a microscope. By doing various kinds of experiments, we've figured out what's the basis of the periodic table of elements. 
Uh, we've mapped out the universe. We know how old the universe is. We know a lot about how the universe was formed, but we cannot, with our senses, perceive the universe other than looking up at the night sky and getting some sense of it's really big out there. And what I'm talking about today is the mapping of the stuff that's in us, our cells, and more particularly within our cells, the DNA that uh, is the blueprint. That can, that's, it's the information that's needed in order to, uh, in order to uh, construct life, in order to make life possible. And, uh, and so, uh, so, uh, so today I will talk a lot about maps. And here's a map of a part of the human genome. In fact, this is a map of chromosome 14, where each of the uh, so-called nucleotides, and there's four of them, uh, a, T, G, C, is colored with a different color. And, uh, and you can find these kinds of maps online. And, uh, and there's, there, it's fun because there are these sort of discussion forums where people kind of gaze at these things and try to see some patterns. But uh, leaving that aside, uh, this, uh, uh, how big is the human genome? Well, you know, here's, here's a, a, a little sort of um, a little uh, graphic of the DNA molecule. And what these little uh, lines are, those are essentially these base pairs, OK? Each line uh, com com is, uh, is essentially one of these uh, molecules, A, T, G, or C. And, uh, and so for instance, if, again, so just to get a sense of the human genome. So uh, the distance between two of these, uh, of these rungs of this ladder in real life in, for DNA is one-third of a nanometer. A nanometer is a billionth of a meter. So get a, to just get a sense of that, uh, imagine that the distance was not that small, but was more something that's, that's reasonable on human scale, say a millimeter. A millimeter is, you know, if you try to put, your, uh, if you try to put two of your fingers together and uh, make it so that they're just touching, that's about a millimeter, okay? So if that were the distance between two, uh, so if that were the distance between two of the essentially dots here, right? Because each dot here is one of these uh, one of these nucleotides. So if that were the distance between two dots, and you were to stretch out uh, this molecule of DNA, it would cover about three thousand kilometers. Okay, three thousand kilometers. That's this red line here, uh, superimposed on the on the map of Africa. And what's amusing is this red line is exactly roughly the area. Uh, where first humans arose, uh, just for the, for the fun of it. Um, so, uh, so in other words, if the distance between two of these base pairs, uh, a base pair is A paired to T, G paired to C. In other words, if the distance between two of these little dots is a millimeter, the human genome is three billion base pairs. So three billion times a mil uh, one millimeter is three million meters. 3 million meters is 3,000 kilometers, which is about 2,000 miles, which is this distance in Africa, okay? On those scales, so on those scales, uh, the size of uh, the human nucleus where all this DNA is packaged is only 2 meters, okay? So 2 meters is roughly my, is, is my height. I'm a little shorter. I'm, uh, I, I'm, I'm missing about 15 centimeters to be two meters. Okay, but so, so imagine, so you have a compartment that's the size of me, and in that compartment, you're gonna fit a molecule whose length is this part of Africa, all right? That's, that's the problem that we're talking about. That's this folded state of the DNA that, that, we're, that, that, I'm, that I wanna tell you about. Okay, so we have three billion base pairs. Uh, how do we compare? I mean, I think this is kind of amusing. Uh, so, you know, ferns have a lot more DNA than we do. So, you know, so, this, so the, one, of the, you know, one of the interesting questions always in science has been, from the dawn of science, is, you know, what is the position of man in the universe, right? And, uh, and so, you know, we like to think of ourselves as very complicated things. Maybe we are, by some measure, but that complexity is not reflected in the size of our DNA. So people have three billion bases of DNA. Amoeba have a lot more. They have about uh, 20 billion. Uh, ferns have more DNA, lilies have more DNA, here's humans. So we're nothing special on this scale, okay? Uh, newts have more DNA, we have about as much of DNA as frogs, so, uh, and only a little less than uh, fruit flies. Um, so, uh, so anyway, so, so certainly if we were, if we certainly sort of, you know, the cool things that humans do 
is, is, is not related to the, size of our, to the size of our genome, this 3 billion base pairs. So where does it reside? What is encoded in the genome? And this is the key question. So we can read the genome, okay? But the key question is if, we, if, you, if I give you the genome, if I give you the sequence, and there it is in color code, right? Somewhere here is, are the instructions for making a human, okay? Well, where is that information, okay? Um, so the thing that we know, that we know about is the information in the genome that tells us about the parts that make us, okay? The parts being the molecules that we're composed of, and, those mo and the most important molecules that we're composed of are proteins. So the only part of the genome we can read is the part that says what are the components of a human or any other living organism, components in the, in the, in the sense of the, molec the molecular parts. What we don't know how to read is how those parts are put together. That's the key message uh, I want to get across. So here's sort of a little more of an explanation of that concept. So what I've been talking about is DNA. And one way to think about DNA and proteins is in terms of languages. So there's two languages of living things. The language of DNA, the NA stands for nucleic acids, and proteins. Um, the alphabet of this language only has four letters. Okay, there's only four molecules, and these molecules they make these two, they make these rungs, they make, sorry, they make this sort of uh, double helical structure where you have these uh, sort of ladders, and the ladders are the pairs because the G molecule comes always paired with C, the A molecule comes paired with T, the C molecule comes paired with G. This is what sort of Watson and before actually Watson and Crick, Shargraf figured out. Um, and so when we talk about the information that's encoded in the DNA, that information is expressed as a series of these letters, G, A, C, A, T, T, G, C, A, and so forth. For, and now you've got to have three billion of those letters to, to give you the human genome. So uh, uh, proteins, on the other hand, uh, they have a more uh, uh, molecules that are strung together like beads on a string that make up a protein. Uh, these 20 molecules here are denoted by different colors and, and different letters, and they're actually called amino acids, and here are sort of their structures. And, uh, and when you string these molecules together, they make uh, long uh, chains of these amino acids, and these chains make proteins. And proteins are the molecules in our cells that do kind of the, the busy work of the cell. Okay, they're the key, key molecules in the cell. And, uh, and what was figured out in the in the 60s and 70s when people talk about the genetic code, that we, we figured out the code, what's been figured out is the translation between the language of DNA and the language of proteins. In other words, how is each one of these amino acids encoded in the DNA? And the trick is that three letters of the DNA alphabet correspond to one letter of the protein alphabet. And that's sort of depicted here. So this little wheel here says if I take the letter U of the DNA alphabet and the letter C of the DNA alphabet and say the letter U, I get serine, which is one of the amino acids. And if, on the other hand, if I have C, C, U, I get this uh, proline amino acid. So when we talk about encoding a protein in the DNA, what we're talking about is a string of these triplets of DNA letters. They're called nucleotides triplets of these DNA letters, each triplet here, like G, A, C. So G, A, uh, C, right there, aspartic acid. So this encodes aspartic acid. So when the, there's a machine in the cell that reads this, and when it sees G, A, C, it incorporates aspartic acid into a chain that makes up a protein, okay? So now we're getting, you know, so, so this is how this whole thing works, right? So you got all these, DN you got this sequence, and then, uh, you know, every three letters tells you what's the amino acid. So this is some amino acid, and this is some amino acid, and this is some amino acid, and then you connect these amino acids, and you get a protein. All right? All right. Here's the problem. If we take the part of the genome that codes for these amino acids, actually that codes for the proteins, that's only 1% of these 3 billion base pairs. Okay, only 
of these 3 billion base pairs that make up the human genome, we know what, the, what, it, what, that, what, what that piece, what that part of the genome does. We know that it codes for proteins. What we don't know is what the other 99% does. That's the problem we've, we, we have at the moment. Uh, so here's how, it, and here's, so I want to explain to you how, you know, so, so here's how you can think about this problem. So I, I grew up in a place called Serbia, which is in, uh, in former, well, it was part of former Yugoslavia. It's in the Balkans, one of those Balkan places. And, uh, and so I was just having fun today. So this is actually one of my favorite dishes when I go home. It's essentially, uh, uh, what do you call these, like kebabs. Okay. Yeah, it's like little sausages. Yeah, they're called chivapchichi. One of the fun things is I've taken some American friends to Serbia and try to, try to pronounce the word chivapchichi. But leaving that aside, we can try that later. Um, so here's, here's the problem, is this 1% of the DNA, okay, that we know what it does, what it codes for, it tells us what the ingredients are. What I'm showing you here is a recipe of how to make these things. Here are the ingredients, and here's the problem. The other 99% of the DNA, what it is, it's the recipe. But the recipe is in some weird language. This is, I can read this, but I don't know if anyone else can here. It'd be amusing if someone can, which means you're from this part of the world. Uh, it's kind of similar to Russian. But, okay, but if I show you this, this looks like language, right? Because you can see their words, and, and, and you know, there's things that are kind of highlighted. This says, how do you make the meat? This is how you roll the meat. And you know, there's, there's, also, there's all sorts of punctuation here that sort of ex tells you that this is a language. And, you know, and there's some ways to try to decipher this language, you know, if you know a couple of words and stuff like that. But here's the problem. We don't even know uh, how this language of, uh, of the, in the DNA is structured, meaning it's the equivalent to the following problem. Someone gave you these ingredients and then gave you a recipe in a completely unknown language, but then got rid of all the punctuation. Okay, so now somewhere, you know, I, you know so, so, so now you got no punctuation, you don't know what the language is, and somehow you're trying to, you're, what you're supposed to figure out is how this, all this stuff tells you, uh, tells you how to take these ingredients and make this. Okay, so that's, that's really the problem we have. We, we have, we have, we have, the, we, we have this, these, this, these letters, you know, and they're all connected up. And we know the parts that explain the ingredients. And we know the final product. Here we are, humans. We walk, we talk, we think, we do all sorts of things, right? But then how do the ingredients, namely how do these proteins, how do you connect them up? How do you put them together to make a human that is equivalent to trying to figure out this, this recipe? Okay, so... Uh, uh, so how DNA is folded tells us actually how, uh, uh, how to mix and match the proteins. Here's a gene, and, the, and what's represented here is, is a machine that reads the gene. And how this machine, uh, or when this machine is engaged so as to read the gene. In other words, when this machine is engaged so as to produce the component that you need for making the person or something else is controlled by all sorts of other parts of the DNA which have to be in contact with the machine. And in order to be in contact, the DNA has to be folded up. And that's where the problem of folding comes in. Okay. So, uh, so then let me then just spend a little bit of time uh, telling you about what we've learned about folding and how we learn about folding. So uh, the way we learn about folding uh, is there's two techniques. And uh, this is a technique that we've been using in my lab is uh, by simply... Uh, labeling the genes. So what we do is uh, by chemical uh, sort of trickery, if you like, we, ha we have a gene on the DNA and we make that gene glow a certain color. Okay, so we can have a gene glow in blue, a gene glow in yellow, a gene glow in red. So here's a gene that we've made yellow, turn glow in yellow, here's a gene that we made glow in blue, and here's a gene that we made glow in red. And so what we can do now is we can, by doing that, we can investigate the position of that gene in the cell, and here's the cell. So the cell that's shown here is our favorite sort of model cell, which is an E. coli cell. It's a bacterial cell. Uh, and the sort of thing we're doing here is we're simply using bacterial cells as a model system because we think there, you know, we, we have this notion that there's some general rules of how this DNA is folded. So maybe if we can understand those rules in an E. coli cell, then, uh, then we can uh, move forward and understand it in humans. So the question then is you have the genetic map, so you have 5 million, so the E. coli genome is one single chromosome with 5 million base pairs. 5 million base pairs is about uh, 2 millimeters of DNA. 
those two millimeters of DNA are packed in the cell, which is two micrometers. A millimeter is a thousandth of a meter. A micrometer is a millionth of a meter. So again, if I were to stretch out this DNA, it would be 1,000 times longer than the size of the compartment, the cell. And here's an artist's rendition of what this packed state looks like. The yellow stuff is the DNA. So that gives you an impression of just this, right? If I were to fold up the DNA, you know, I'd get something really messy, and that's this yellow string here, OK? So the way we're trying to understand the folded state is we look at the position of, the different, of different genes. And, uh, and, I, and I'm just going to tell you this little story, and then I'll stop. So we do experiments. We look at the position of the genes. But you see, one of the things about science is it's sort of useless to do experiments if, unless, you, or unless you come to them with a certain prejudice. So it's good. You know, people talk about science having, needing to be objective. That's completely true. But whenever we do science, in, when, whenever we do experiments in science, we always come to the experiment with a certain idea of what we think is going to happen. Okay? And sometimes, and most interesting things that happen in science is when the experiment reveals something that we did not expect. And, and uh, Darwin, I think, said that very nicely in a letter to, to Henry Fawcett in 18, 1861. He said, about 30 years ago, there was much talk that geologists, geologists only ought only to observe and not theorize. And I well remember someone saying that at this rate, a man might as well go into a gravel pit and count the pebbles and describe the colors. How odd it is that anyone should not see that all observation must be for or against some view if it is to be of any service. Okay, so whenever we go into the lab, we have a particular view and we make observations. So the idea was the following. Uh, what we expected is that if I were to label a gene and now I fold up the DNA, what I would expect is that gene should be pretty much anywhere at random inside the cell. Okay, why? Because the length of the DNA is a thousand times bigger than the size of the cell. So I have to fold this a thousand times, and by the end of the day, when I've done these thousand foldings, where the gene en ends up should be completely random. And when we did the experiment, we found something completely different. What we found is that every single gene in E. coli, and in E. coli there are 2,000 genes, every single gene is at a very specific location. In other words, if I label a gene blue, then in every cell, that gene is roughly the, this blue gene is roughly, for instance, in the middle of the cell, okay? Somehow, the DNA is folded in exactly, in each cell is in, ex in exactly the same way. And this precision of the position of the gene within the cell is less than 10% of the length of the cell. So it's as though that every, it's as though every single gene in an E. coli cell has a little GPS device, like it has a little iPhone with a GPS, and it tells it where to sit in the cell. Of course, there's no GPS device. In fact, we don't know what this GPS device is. But what we've discovered is that there's an order to this folding, even though it, would, it, sort of, it, it completely eluded us that there was a possibility to this happening because of the fact that the DNA is so huge and it has to be compacted in such a small volume. And, uh, and this led us to propose sort of a model of, this, of the structure of this, of this uh, chromosome having to do with uh, it being like a little rubber band, uh, uh, a sort of compacted rubber band that we think we can now, uh, we now have an idea of how this, of this, uh, how this organization comes about, but it's, it's, it's not that important. Uh, there's another experiment that I, 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 I'm not going to bore you with, which, which, which produces the same result, and so this, the basic result is that every gene in E. coli sits at a specific place. Now, what's really exciting is that the exact same thing is found, or a very similar thing is, is found for human genes. So again, here's, uh, here's chromosome uh, 14. Uh, and this chromosome has uh, 160, 106 million base pairs. There's about 1,200 genes in there. Uh, each gene, you see, you can see this, each gene is about 1,000 base pairs. So only 100,000 bases is genes. But there's a million total, OK? So, uh, or 100, sorry, 100 million. So, uh, so less than 1% of this thing is, is, is genes. And, uh, and here's what uh, experiments where each gene in, the human, uh, in a human cell was colored, just like I, I, we colored individual genes. Here, each chromosome, I apologize, each chromosome was covered in a different color. And what you find is that chromosomes occupy certain territories. So here's I was showing you chromosome 14. Here's chromosome 14. Again, the total amount of DNA here is meters. 
three meters. It's in a compartment that's a million times smaller. You expect to see a jumbled mess, something like this, where there is no structure. But what we find is structure. And what we now know is that that structure is functional, meaning that if we disrupt the structure, we get cells that don't behave properly. And going back to the idea of what's the information encoded in the genome, the question we're all start, we're trying to tackle is where in the sequence of the DNA is the information about this structure encoded? Where does that information reside? And we don't as yet have an answer to that. Uh, what we do know, and this is some very sort of recent studies, is that, for instance, and, and this is now becoming sort of quite a big area of research, is that when we look at uh, maps, and, and, and without getting into details of what this particular map is, but when we look at maps of this folded structure in, uh, in, in, in cancer cells, then we find that those maps correlate with certain genetic abnormalities in these cancer cells. In other words, the disruption of this, uh, of, this, uh, of this folded state seems to correlate with, with genetic uh, vari variations that occur in cancer cells. So there's sort of an idea that by studying how the folded, uh, what the folded state of the genome is, we can learn, we can learn about uh, how uh, essentially, you know, how this, uh, uh, just going back to my little analogy, uh, we can learn how the recipe being misread and the misreading of this recipe is what, what eventually uh, leads to, uh, among other things, cancer. So, um, so let me then uh, just summarize, and I would be happy to get que I mean questions. Uh, so uh, what we're trying to do at this point, and we only have a few uh, examples where we've done this, and uh, in, 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 uh, when I say we, I mean uh, the community of scientists, the scientists that I belong to, is we're looking at these different organisms. Uh, there's E. coli, that's the bacterium I talked about. There's the baker's yeast that I mentioned. It was one of the first organisms that were sequenced. Here's human genomes, and we're trying to understand this folded state because we believe that this folded state carries some important information about the recipe, about what is it that makes it so that uh, the components, the proteins that make up the living things, what is it that tells those components how to assemble, in which order, when, so as to get something like a human being from the point of view of medicine? The reason we want to understand this is because when that reading of the recipe fails is when uh, we get diseased states. And uh, just, uh, I think I'm going to stop here. And uh, this work is very sort of interdisciplinary. Uh, there's a number of students and other faculty involved that I work with. Julie Therio is a good friend of mine. Uh, she's a professor of cell biology at Stanford, and uh, her uh, student, uh, postdoc, I should say, worked very much on this project as the, uh, together with one of my uh, former students, Jeremy, who's now a professor at the University of Kansas. And these are various graduate students and undergraduates that work with me, and, and Paul Wiggins, who was uh, at MIT at the time, and uh, sort of all these people kind of could have been, uh, I've been trying to convey in this little lecture. So uh, thank you so much for your attention, and uh, if you have any additional questions, I'd be very happy to uh, talk to you about it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, well, you could. It's it's not as bad as that uh, because you could, uh, you you know, even though you can't read the recipe, you could uh, figure out that if the recipe gets messed up right here, then you don't get that. So you don't know why. You know, exchange. You know, so uh, <laughs> this is kind of fun trying to read this. Read this. Uh, oh, here it says make it with a machine, not by hand. So you know, so if this piece that says machine so it gets deleted, something that happens, for instance, in cancer, you have deletions, right? So if that gets deleted, then if I knew how to, you know, then I'd miss the information that I should be making. I should be grinding the. I think that's not the grinding; it's the mixing of the meat should be done with a mixer, not by hand, for some reason. Uh, so if I miss, miss, miss that, uh, this apparently won't come out right. So, uh, so, so, you know, so, so, so even though I don't understand, uh, 
that this word means machine, I can certainly do a study where I can say that if that word is missing, something goes wrong. Mm -hmm. The problem is, is then, is I think, you know, why we're trying to get past that model and try to read this is that make it, that would allow to us to be much more effective and more predictive we, we, if we understand the mechanisms. And, and so, uh, because there's a problem with this, right? Because, I, I, so friends, a friend of mine and I invented this, uh, this concept of the lethal seatbelt knockout. So, so, so just to kind of comment on that. So uh, here's the problem, right? So if you went into a, into a plane uh, and, and cut off all the seatbelts, the plane wouldn't fly. Right, because they would ground they would ground it, right? Because it can't take off if, if the passengers don't have their seatbelts fastened. So if you're doing this kind of analysis, you would have to conclude that for the for the flight of an airplane, it's critical that there are seatbelts on the plane. But it isn't. That just has to do with FAA regulations, right? So one of the problems with doing these kinds of things, we find these pieces of the DNA which are critical, but we don't know if that it, it's just like these seatbelts. We don't know if this is at all relevant for the basic process that, that leads to the disease state. And I think that's, that's uh, making it harder for us to, to really sort of treat and, and understand what's going on. The, the gentleman back there had a question. So what, what reads the recipe part? Pardon? What reads the recipe part? What reads it? So you, you talked about the thing that transcribes the DNA into proteins. Right. So yeah, what? yeah, yeah, no, great question. Yeah. So we know some parts. Okay, so there are some parts uh, that serve as landing sites for yet sort of proteins, and the, and that's these these guys here, and these proteins, what they do is they by contacting the machine that makes uh, that reads the gene, uh, they uh, turn that machine on and off. So uh, so there are these pieces they're called regulatory DNA, uh, where uh, where. Um, which uh, are read essentially by, by these proteins. Um, then there's, there's other stuff going on. Uh, and actually, uh, there's a, a, a huge project now underway, funded by the US government, to try to read the rest of the genome. It's uh, called the ENCODE, proje ENCODE project. There's about 30. 30 to 100, 30 ish institutions involved, and you know, a few hundred scientists. And, uh, and it's trying to understand all the different ways, all the different sort of molecular processes involved in reading the, the recipe. So I told you one. And there's a few others that we know about. And so, so, the, so, 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 so now we're at the, in the stage of trying to kind of read the, 90, the, the other 99%. And so far, as far as I remember, it's only one percent of that that's been that's been sort of that's been kind of read out. So it's slow going. It's not as easy as just uh, reading the DNA. When I say reading, it actually means taking that piece of the DNA that we know doesn't make protein but does something, then figuring out what it does. We can again, we have no problem in going back to my analogy. Uh, we have no problem in uh, uh, this movie is screwing me up all the time. We have no problem in actually uh, getting that. Yeah, we have. So you got it. So we have no problem in getting in getting in getting that, right? It's now going in and saying, "Aha! What this bit does is it binds this protein, and by binding this protein, it turns the gene some gene on or off." And that's that's proving to be far more difficult than what we did in 2003, which is read the human genome. Yes. Uh. Oh, yeah. So I know that on um, on one slide you had uh, examples of how like uh, certain genes can make you, uh, affect physical traits. Is there any like connection between how certain genes can affect uh, your behavior or memory or attention? Uh huh. Yes. Or anything uh, cognitive? Yes, actually, that's that's a uh, that's a big uh, subject of, uh, of research at, at, uh, at the university where I'm at, Brandeis. Uh, it, there's a whole field of behavioral genomics. Uh, and the idea is, uh, it goes actually back to a, 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 a guy who worked with these guys and then went to Caltech, who was also a physicist, and then uh, started thinking about this. So yes, uh, so, um, uh, so for instance, in fruit flies, uh, there are specific genes that, uh, that if you mess with them, they alter their behavior. Uh, 
the one that I'm familiar with is that the, uh, I forget if it was the male or the female, guessing male, uh, performed some complicated flight uh, routine uh, before mating with the female. And if you mess with one particular gene, you mess up the, the whole flight pattern. <laughs> uh, and there's similar, there's similar uh, other, other things. Uh, but uh, so yes, uh, but that's in fruit flies. You know, most traits are not single gene, one gene, one trait, right? Uh, the total number of genes, I might have failed to mention that in the, hum in the human genome is 20,000. There are 20, so in other words, there's 20, 000, we're made out of 20,000 different kinds of Lego blocks. Okay, so the 1% specifies 20,000 different ingredients, okay, 20,000 different proteins, which is only 10 times as many as in, in a little simple bacterium called E. coli. So the complexity has to lie in the recipe and how these 20,000 Lego blocks are put together. And for all of you who've played with Lego blocks, you know even with a few different kinds of Lego blocks, you can get very complicated structures, you know, as long as you have uh, some instructions, <laughs> which can be, you know, thousands of pages, like for the Death Star, which my son desperately wants me to build with him, which is a real pain <laughs> in the rear end. So, uh, so, so that's, yeah. Um, so that's the problem with things like identifying behavior is that it's usually, uh, there's some examples where you can find one gene, but usually it's, it's a collection of many genes acting in, in, in a, some kind of concentrated way that gives you some interesting uh, behavior like that. And that's also true of most uh, common diseases or most common genetic, you know, most, most common diseases that ail us are not single gene, single disease, are mo many, many genes. And you mentioned a codon. I kind of didn't yeah. quite follow that. Just what is a uh, codon? Oh, sorry. Yes. Uh, so uh, a codon is simply a, a collection of three, uh, a three nucleotides. So, uh, so DNA uh, is made up of these uh, four basic units. GT. So a, a stretch of DNA molecules is, is sort of connect, you know, it's just a stretch uh, of, uh, of these molecules that are connected in this particular funny way. Um, where not, you can connect in this way as many as, uh, you know, millions and billions of these units, right? So if you connect millions and billions of these units, you'll get something like G, A, C, G, 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 you know, you'll get something that, that looks like that, right? Does that make sense? And then, and then the codon is just three in a row. Now the reason you need three in a row is you have 20 proteins. And so if you have, if you have one, if, you can't just specify one protein with one letter because you have only four possibilities here, and there are 20 amino acids. If you had two letters, then the number of things you could specify is 16 because you have four possibilities for this and four of this, so the total is 16. That's still not enough. Three gets you 64, and now you have more than enough. And so you actually, so that means that uh, three let if you use three letters, that means you can specify 64 different things words, amino acids, if you like. So in other words, you can make 64 different words with three letters, uh, where each letter can be out of an alphabet of four. <laughs> and, uh, and the fact that uh, multiple triplets, like here, U, A, and all these, got, you know, so U, A, U makes tyrosine, but also U, A, C makes tyrosine. Okay, so there's this kind of degeneracy to the code. I might be now going off on some crazy tangent that doesn't interest you. I apologize. But to just answer your question, it's three letters uh, made up of these three molecules. Uh, they are a codon. And they specify one amino acid, one out of 20 amino acids. And each protein is a string of amino acids. How big is a protein? About 300 amino acids, just to have some numbers in your head. So a gene, uh, the part that codes for a protein is about 1,000 uh, bases because or it's 900 if you want, because if you need to specify 300 amino acids for a protein, for each amino acid you need three, so it's 300 times three, so that's 900. Okay, so a gene is 900, let's say 1,000. That's why 20,000 genes in the human genome is about, that's about uh, 20,000 times 1,000, that's about 20 million. But there's uh, three billion base pairs. <laughs> By the way, in E. coli, this is very interesting, in all bacteria, the, like in E. coli, the size of the genome is 5 million base pairs. Now, if 1,000, in other words, a th a 5 million of these letters, but you need 1,000 to specify a protein. So now if all the DNA was genes, right, 
5 million divided by 1,000, it's 5,000. That's actually almost right. E. coli has about three or 4,000. So in E. coli, actually, all the DNA is practically genes. And this is true of all bacteria. But then you get to higher forms of life, and this falls apart. In other words, only a tiny fraction of the genome is the part that codes. This is, again, something that's really curious that we don't understand. Why is it that in the sort of evolution of life, all of a sudden, big genomes emerged? But these big genomes didn't make for lots more proteins, OK? In other words, our genome is 1,000 times bigger than the E. coli genome. But we only have five times as many proteins. <laughs> so it looks like what, what nature somehow managed to figure out is that, or I don't know, somehow evolution went in this, way, in this direction of not making more Lego parts, but making more complicated instructions how to put those Lego pieces together. That seems to have, uh, whether that's the only way to evolve more complex life forms, we don't know. And we'll probably only know when, if, if and when we, we find some other complex life forms outside of this planet. Yeah? Are there any theories for, like, why there would be those, like, gaps in the DNA? Uh, when you say gaps, what are, what are you referring to, sir? Uh, like the spaces between the DNA that you said is red for proteins. Uh, what so, uh, okay, uh, is this what you meant? Yeah. Uh -huh. Uh, yeah, so, uh, so there's, uh, there's, there's, you know, there, there's Just So Stories. There's a beautiful book by uh, Kipling uh, called Just So Stories where he talks about how the leopard got its stripes and stuff like that. These are very cute stories that are nonsensical but fun. And so there's lots of just so stories about these things. Uh, so, uh, so the just so story, in other words, we, we don't know if this is true, but it seems reasonable is that, well, the problem is, is you, well, uh, why the spacer DNA? Maybe uh, because uh, you want to have a very complicated control over this machine that reads the gene. Complicated meaning that it integrates many inputs, right? So each of these proteins is actually, in some sense, detecting something in the cell or outside the cell. And it's like you can think of these as little detectors. And when all these detectors go on and off, depending on how these detectors go on and off, that determines whether the gene is read. Okay. Now, you could try and put all those detectors right next to the, to the gene. And that's what, he call, that's what bacteria do, in fact. But then you can't put too many because... Uh, there's just not enough room. So the idea is the way that uh, uh, life forms, uh, in complicated life forms, the way that this got resolved is by putting these sort of elements further away uh, and, then re and then sort of using this folding of the DNA to bring them spatially close together. In other words, they're far away on the gene, right? This could be thousands of base pairs. But then by the folding of the DNA, they're brought in close spatial proximity. So that, to do that, you need this kind of spacer DNA. This yes, may be ahead. far afield, but yeah. how does a virus hijack, hijack a, a cell, a, the DNA? <coughs> oh, that's a great question. Uh, I love that question. That's, that's something I spent a lot of, uh, uh, about 10 years ago, we st spent a lot of time thinking about uh, problems associated with that. So, uh, okay, so uh, a virus is, uh, uh, Okay, I just because I'm enamored with technology, so let's see if I can do this. Uh, okay, so check it out. Okay, so a virus looks something like this. Okay, it's a shell, and it's made of protein, and inside this protein is DNA. Okay, and now what a virus does is it encounters a cell. So, uh, so this virus now uh, gets to a cell. So here's a cell. And uh, here's the little virus. And uh, what it does is injects the DNA into the cell, OK? And so, uh, so here's the amusing thing. So uh, when it's injected into the cell, now the cell sees there's DNA. But the cell doesn't know that, well, it, it has ways of trying to figure out that it's not its own DNA, because inside here, there's also the, the cell's DNA, right? So this is the cell's. 
DNA, and this is the virus DNA. It's just DNA. So there's these machines that read the DNA. So they just go off and read the virus DNA. Okay? <laughs> and uh, as they read the virus DNA, what are they making? They're making virus proteins. What are virus proteins? They're proteins that uh, actually make up this thing. So in other words, the virus just injects its DNA, and then the cell just reads it. It's like, you know, it's essentially like there are these, there's this, these sci-fi movies. I think uh, Contact was one of them, where uh, aliens beam a message, right? And the message is blueprints for making some machine. And then people busily, you know, start making that machine. And then someone in, <coughs> at the Pentagon comes to the president and says, wait, do we know that this mach once we build it, this machine just won't blow us to bits, right? How do we know this machine won't just kill us, right? Well, that's exactly what the virus does. It, sends, it just gives the cell the blueprint, the DNA, and the cell reads it. And as it reads it, it makes proteins. These proteins assemble into a virus. And boom, all of a sudden, you have a cell filled with viruses, and they kill the cell, and, you're, and the cell's dead. Thank you.